Okay, so we're going to turn our attention in this module to international norms, laws, and regimes. And so we're going to divide this into three separate lectures. All right, so if we think about international law, one thing that comes to mind is, does anyone really care about international law? To the extent that what entity is actually going to enforce international law? There was a case in 1984 um, in where the United States, specifically the CIA, was brought before the world court that existed at the time, accused of attempting to overthrow and destabilize the government of the duly elected Sandinistas. The court ruled in favor of Nicaragua. So what was the result of that ruling? I mean, so they ruled in favor of Nicaragua against the United States, so what happened? Well, nothing. There's no enforcement me mechanism. Another result was the withdrawal of the United States from the world court's jurisdiction. All right, well, that's uh, as a side note. Well, this leads to really two observations about international law in general. One is that compliance is left to the individual state, and that's where state sovereignty plays a role. When countries like the United States fail to adhere to international law, it sets a precedent to others to follow. So the United States becomes an international outlaw, if you will, regarding the world court, for example. More recently, the United States refused to join the Rome Statute and then um, the International Criminal Court, which we're not a member of, and it puts them in the categories, uh, in the category of many, as, as rogue states. Um, the end result is that if the hegemon, the leading country in the international system, supposedly one of the most democratic states, snubs its nose at international law, what can we expect from non-democratic states and other rogue states? Okay, so uh, one, at, so so again, one concern is compliance. The other concern is it sets a precedence for others. Okay, and so many find international law weak and defenseless. Okay, so we want to kind of talk on that subject for a little while and talk really about international law in general and then how it applies to human rights law in, in specifically. So if we think about just the basics of international law, some definitions and aspects, all right. Um, one of the concerns about international law is this compliance mechanism that I just that I just spoke of all right how do we ensure uh, states are going to comply so that's one concern uh, another concern is how is domestic law and international law the same and or different so remember international laws are rules that govern the conduct of states in their relations with one another versus domestic law, which is um, the laws that govern a particular state. And so there are legal systems and morality in, in, at play in terms of the aspects of law. So a legal system helps limit the role of pure power in a domestic system, for example. So domestically, if we think about the United States, we have a constitution and we have the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment to the Bill of Rights talks about equal treatment under the law, um, and so those, that's a legal system that helps limit the rule of pure power of government domestically. Morality is a second component that restrains the role of power in domestic politics, and there's a greater sense in domestic systems than there is in the international system that there's some sort of appropriate code of conduct that exists for you and I, okay? So, is there a legal system and does morality play a role in the international system or in international law? If we think about our two competing theories that I talked about in terms of IR, realists would argue that basically neither exists in the face of self-interest and state sovereignty. And idealists or liberals are not so naive to expect a perfect world, only a better world. Okay. So, we shouldn't think um, that these two things are synonymous. And even though there's laws and rules domestically, people break those all the time. But we have a compliance and adjudication process domestically that really isn't developed as much at the international level. So let's just take about, uh, talk about a few things about the fundamentals of international law. Okay? First thing to consider is that the uh, that, evidence, that international law is very primitive in nature. There's no set of laws, domestic or international, that are simply hatched and emerged full-blown. 
Rather, laws evolve and grow from primitive levels to more sophisticated levels as time and circumstances dictate. So modern by no account means final. Centuries from now, observers will view our current modern system of international law as extremely primitive. While domestic legal systems might be considered quite developed, the international legal system falls more toward the primitive end of the evolutionary scale of legal systems, and there's reasons for that. First, we can think of the international system does not have a formal rulemaking or legislative process. Again, the United, Nation, the United Nations isn't one world government. And just because um, uh, agreements go through the UN doesn't make them binding in a certain way or make them easy to uh, ensure compliance. There's codes of behavior at the international system that are derived from custom or from explicit agreements among two or more societal members or groups. Okay, So we do have international treaties that bind states together like NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement. So we have a, a contract, if you will, with Canada and, and Mexico to deal with certain issues about trade. But there's little or no authority in any formal government to judge or punish violations of law. So it's, it's primitive legal systems have no real police or courts. And so we, we will see that there are these international courts uh, when it deals with human rights in particular, and they're evolving to where they have more and more power, but they don't nearly compete with domestic nature of law. Okay. So like all primitive societies, the international system is made up of self-defined units, states in this case, that are territorial-based. They primarily govern itself and resort to violent self-help in relations with other groups. And think about primitive societies. That's how they operated, and that's how the national system tends to operate. All these traits characterize primitive societies as well as the international system. Well, what can we draw from this acknowledgement that international law is primitive? First, we can see that international law does exist, even if it's not as developed as some might wish. And second, it encourages us um, in, to think that the international society and its law may evolve to some higher order someday. So, we, we're in an evolutionary process when it comes to international law. And there are some types of international law that are more binding and have more consequences than others. And so we'll talk a little bit later about human rights law tends to be perceived as quite weak compared to other international laws governing things like nuclear weapons, for example. All right. But we know that there's been growth and expansion of international law. And so where did all of that start? Well, the emergence of international law coincides with the emergence or origins of the state. And again, I'm talking about the origins of nation states, okay? As individual sovereign territorial states arose, the leaders of each realized the need to define and protect their status as an individual sovereign entity. How can I ensure if I'm a leader of a country that I have some rights in the international community so that I'm not constantly being bombarded or um, invaded. So this kind of laws started to evolve about war, for example. So international law was necessary in order to maintain relations with other states. Um, and so the basis of this new emerging international law is pretty much what we talked about in terms of the emergence of human rights, and that is elements of ancient Jewish, Greek, and Roman practice combined with new Christian concepts regarding custom and practices all led to this emergence of international law. And again, we can look at some early theorists. Hugo Grotius, from 1583 to 1645, wrote a text on the law of war and peace, and he's often referred to as the father of international law. And he debated the sources of international law, its role in regulating the relations of states and its application to specific situations. So for example, when is it justified to go to war? What is the conduct of war? How should treatment of subjugated peoples, uh, the, the, the spoils of the victor, if you will, how, how should that occur? All right. And so from that time forward, we had this evolutionary process about conduct during war. And we have it all the way up through the different Geneva Conventions, for example. But the 20th century marked the most rapid expansion of international law and its practical importance for several reasons. One is you have an increasing international interaction due to technology, due to the movement of people and things and um, ideas. You have greater levels of interdependence where some states depend upon others for certain types of products, for example. 
and it points to the need for rules to govern a whole host of functional areas. So they needed rules regarding trade. We need rules and laws regarding finance, travel, communications. And so how do we communicate with each other and how are we trading with, the, with each other? There needs to be rules and laws about that. But perhaps most importantly, the 20th century witnessed mankind's ability to destroy itself and its environment and commit a whole host of human rights abuses leading to lawmaking international treaties on a whole host of subjects such as genocide, nuclear testing, use of the oceans, and human rights. So the act of war in other areas of national security has become the subject of international law. Well, how does this really work in practice? Is it just a theory or can it actually be applied? Realists believe that international law obviously exists, okay, but it's really hard to put it into practice because states can choose to ignore it. So as evidence, there is a whole host of ongoing, largely unpunished examples of lawlessness such as war and human rights abuses. But some argue that the realist argument is flawed because there has been international law that's been effective in many areas, war tribunals, for example nuclear agreements. The fact that law does not cover all problem areas and that it's not always followed does not disprove its existence. So again, there's a substantial crime rate in the U.S., but that doesn't mean there's not laws. Again, drug use is, according to some, running rampant, yet we have laws against the use of illegal drugs. All right, so just because you um, have people violating laws doesn't mean that those laws still don't exist. So when is international law most effective when it comes to practice? And there seems to be a consensus of that when it governs what is referred to as transnational functional relations or those relations between states that serve as a function such as trade, diplomatic rules, communications, that's when it tends to be the most effective. When international law is deemed least effective is when it's applied to what we call high politics issues such as national security, or when vital interests are concerned. All right, so, so that's what we're thinking about in terms of fundamentals of international law, okay. Well, how is international law made? How do we go about getting a piece of international law? Well, there's different sources of international law, and so we'll start with the first, which is a treaty, okay. International treaties, um, they're codified, they're written down. Um, um, so you can point to an, a treaty between states that both have agreed to, or all parties have agreed to, and it's gone through their domestic process of approval. And so a treaty is agreement between states that is binding, um, and these treaties are binding to those who sign them. We have multilateral treaties, and they were seen as important as they begin to establish norms that take on a system-wide legitimacy. So it might be that two or three states agree to a multilateral treaty, and eventually more and more states um, become a party to that particular treaty. So for example, the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide has been ratified by most states, but not all. However, genocide has been recognized and codified as a violation of international law, and this standard of conduct is binding on all states regardless of whether or not they formally agree to the treaty. So this is where we see multilateral treaties establish a norm. A norm is an accepted type of behavior, if you will. Okay. Another place that we get international law is through custom. Okay. The old but now supplanted rule that territorial waters extend three miles from the shore grew from the distance of a cannon, uh, was established because of the distance a cannon could fire. So basically when people were deciding where does the United States end and international waters begin, it was because, well, we can reach three miles from shore by a cannon. So if you're outside the range of land-based artillery, then you're in international waters. Well, now we have international or uh, inter, uh, we have ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles that can reach just about anywhere. So now we've had to codify what is it meant by international waters. So maritime rules, rules of diplomacy are also additional examples of customs that have become part of the lexicon of international law. 
There's something called the general principles of law. By this standard, the International Court of Justice applies the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Well, what does that mean? It seems a bit vague. Basically, it allows external sources of law, like from countries such as morality, to be considered. Um, so, so countries can look at particular issues that go beyond the letter of the law and say, um, is this a moral act or not? So more than any other standard, it was this principle that Iraq's aggression violated the morality of states in 1990 when it invaded Kuwait. International law also looks at judicial decisions and scholarly writing. Okay? Um, even though there are certain limits placed on the international community, the, the international community uh, and the courts that are established internationally do rely upon each other and cite each other when it comes to making decisions. So previous rulings of the International Court of Justice, for example, or other tribunals become part of that international body of law. And then we have international representative assemblies, the UN General Assembly, for example. This source of, inter of, inter of international law is far more controversial, however, particularly since international law is non-legislative in nature. The UN General Assembly cannot legislate law similar to domestic legislatures. So we have an assembly, if you will, the U.S. Congress that makes laws that we are then bound by. Well, the UN General Assembly can pass resolution after resolution. That doesn't make it international law, for example. Um, so we can see that there are decisions out of the General Assembly um, slapping Israel on the hand, for example, or the United States for certain actions in the Middle East, and the United States and Israel simply ignores that. Okay? However, as members of the UN, countries are bound to abide by some of the decisions of the UN General Assembly and the Security Council. And this is facilitated when there's an overwhelming vote in the General Assembly, and such votes tend to reflect international custom or general principles of law. So there's a lot of international pressure to abide by those, but again, states can simply ignore it. Okay? And that leads to the issue of adherence to international law. And this is a third essential element of, e of any legal system. In order to be effective, a legal system needs to have a mixture of compliance and enforcement. Generally, people obey the law because of a mixture of voluntary and coerced compliance. You and I tend to probably follow the law on a regular basis out of um, voluntary means, uh, you know, we're not going around killing each other, probably from a moral perspective, um, but we also tend to uh, obey laws because they are coerced compliance as well, okay? States enforce law through a mixture of enforcement by central authorities and enforcement through self-help. So we tend to self-regulate our behavior a lot based upon our moral core, if you will. Um, and we also tend to skirt by some laws as well. Everyone driving up I-45 um, speeds on a regular basis, and so then it becomes an enforcement issue. Okay? Compliance is obedience to the law. We have voluntary compliance. It occurs when the person or state obeys the laws because they accept that it's legitimate. People accept the authority of the institution that made the rules, and they agree that the rules are necessary for the conduct of society. Okay. There's also compliance through coercion, the process of gaining compliance through threats of violence, imprisonment, economic sanction, or other punishment. And most legal systems are placed somewhere on this continuum. And as you might imagine, the overall degree of compliance to the law is much lower in the international system compared to that in most domestic systems. So the international system tends to rely more on voluntary compliance. Well, what about enforcement? Enforcement relies upon a combination of, uh, again, central authorities and through self-help. So the central authority, again, that's, my, that's what you think it is, the police. Self-help is this kind of doctrine of self-defense. So we do have this element of self-help in the United States that we are, we are allowed to defend ourselves in case we're attacked, for example. Well, primitive societies rely primarily on self-help and mediation to enforce laws and norms. With evolution, primitive societies begin to develop enforcement authorities. And this goes hand in hand with the ideas of Locke and Hobbes that we talked about, that at some point, individuals and groups give up individual self-defense to the government for protection, that kind of social contract. 
And while domestic systems have made this change, the international system is just beginning or in the process of making this evolutionary change. So enforcement mechanisms or enforcement organizations at the international level have little bite teeth and sanctions, okay? I'm sorry, little, little, little enforcement mechanisms and that sanctions are mildly economic in nature. So we have a lot of punishment at the international system that is carried out through the sanctions of states. International law continues, continues to rely mainly on self-help, okay? So if we think about examples of international enforcement, the indictments of war criminals after World War II, we've had war crimes tribunals in the former Yugoslavia, war crimes tribunals for Rwanda. And so we, we can see that there is this enforcement mechanism, particularly in war crimes tribunals. The, um, in, in non-human rights examples, there are, if we look at the case of what's going on right now with uh, the nuclear proliferation treaty and how Iran is being subjected to uh, inspections, that's a force, that's a type of enforcement. All right, well adjudication of international law, how do you resolve disputes? As the legal system becomes more sophisticated, the method of settling disputes evolves. So you go from a primary reliance on bargaining between individuals through mediation to adjudication by neutral parties. The international system of law is in the early stages of this developmental process and is now developing the institutions and attitudes necessary for adjudication. So we have international courts and we've had an evolution of these types of tribunals extending back to the permanent court of international arbitration established by the Hague Conference at the turn of the 20th century. Then in 1922, we had the Permanent Court of International Justice as part of the League of Nations. Well, that, of course, has gone away. In 1946, the International Court of Justice was established and associated with the UN. The International Court of Ju uh, Justice is now known as the World Court. It sits in The Hague and consists of 15 judges who are elected to nine-year terms through a voting process in the UN. But there's additional courts. There's the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the Central American Court of Justice, the Community Tribunal of the Economic Community of West African States. And so while none of these have authority that the domestic courts have, they are gaining more credibility. The mere existence sometimes has an impact by making people's, uh, people of governments change their behavior rather than face an adverse ruling. So even though they can ignore international law, no one likes to be convicted of a human rights crime. So no country likes to have that kind of publicity. Of course, there's now the ICC, and we'll talk a lot more about the ICC uh, uh, in, in, in coming lectures, okay? And so although the creation of such courts is seen as progress, we still have this problem of sovereignty as a potential barrier to adjudication. The authority of some of these courts extends to theory, extends in theory to all international legal disputes. But we know that um, uh, many people tend to, again, ignore these particular uh, courts or try to, in some way or another, avoid, if you will, um, the jurisdiction of those courts. All right. I want to briefly talk about establishing a human rights regime. And again, a regime here isn't talking about a good or bad government. It's talking about a institution, um, an international grouping, if you will, where um, you have a topic area and then you have such as human rights or if you have um, the, the issue of proliferation, or if you have the issue of, um, of uh, whaling or other types of protection of the oceans, um, there's a whaling regime even. So if we think about how to define a regime, um, Stephen Krasner in 1982 set up this definition that a regime includes a sets of implicit or explicit principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actors' expectations converge in a given area of international relations. So in the area of human rights, there's a set of implicit or explicit principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around what we expect as state actors, as non-governmental organizations, as IGOs, what are our expectations around a given area 
this in this case human rights all right so if we think about how a uh, human rights regime is set up we can kind of think of three parts you have international law is one element so we have the universal declaration of human rights we have these different covenants dealing with certain types of human rights and then we have IGOs that govern these laws so the UN the international I'm sorry the European Union the International Criminal Court so you have international law, you have IGOs, and then you have NGOs that act as watchdogs that can act outside the purview of state uh, borders. So these are just a few examples, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, etc. Okay. So the next lecture is going to focus on these elements of the human rights regime. And as time has passed, this regime has evolved more and more over time. All right. Bergenthal, in Chapter 3 of your text, talks about the evolution of international human rights norms and institutions. And these norms and institutions are part of the human rights regime. So he talks about stage one of this evolution is the normative foundation. Right? So he talks about the norms of human rights and how they became part of the international lexicon particularly after what happened in World War II. So he talks about the UN Charter that st talks about human rights and specifically three articles, Article 1, Article 55, and 56 that are really focusing in on the human rights element. Okay, and talks about what the Charter and what the members of the UN are um, going to be agreeing to and what the scope, if you will, of those norms are. The second stage is the building of the institutions, and this starts in the 1960s and, and, and lasts about the 1980s. And this is where we start to look within the UN how the different um, sub-institutions of the UN are dealing with the issue of human rights. So you, you can go through that process uh, in reading page 74 and 75 of the text where you really start to see the emergence of two um, elements from the um, uh, from the original um, uh, Declaration of Human Rights broken into two covenants the covenant on economic and political rights and the covenant on economic social and, and cultural rights and again institutions don't really have to be an actual building right it doesn't have to be uh, a five-story building somewhere institutions are um, think beyond just a tangible building, if you will. Institutions are the norms and the, um, uh, the organizations all part of that as, as, evolu uh, as part of the institution. Step three is, or stage three from his perspective, really talks about what happens after the Cold War is over. And the Vienna Declaration occurs in 1993, which really reaffirms the international community's perspective on human rights. And so it's important to think about how the end of the Cold War impacted the um, implementation of human rights law because we move away from that ideological Cold War where the West is focusing mainly on political and civil rights and the non-West is looking at economic and social rights. So the end of the Cold War had a, a pretty big impact on the international community's perspective and how the UN was going to deal um, with human rights as a whole. And then stage four, he talks about individual responsibility and moving beyond these traditional types of human rights in terms of minority rights as well as looking at whether or not humanitarian intervention on a collective security basis is going to be the move for the future. So that helps you outline the Bergenthal article that you'll need to look at with the evolution of the human rights regime. And then I have posted for you an article that I wrote with the, the co-author from, uh, from Stephen F. Austin uh, our article about um, the Empire Strikes Back, and this is a play, of course, on the on the movie. But basically, we wrote a, an article about whether or not the U.S. involvement in torture in the war on uh, the war on terror is somehow an assault on the international human rights regime. And so, you will need to read through this article, and just very briefly, there's an introductory period, and then on page 434 through page. 437, there is a discussion about what are regimes and do they matter. So this will help reinforce what regimes do and what they are. So you'll want to pay attention to that. Um, and then as we move into um, page 437, we start to talk specifically about the evolution of the human rights regime. And this is why I want to bring this up. 
we talk about having several different phases as well, where phase one is characterized by hegemonic support for the idea of the human rights regime. And again, the hegemon is the leading state in the international system, the United States. Um, phase two is a phase that we call passive support during the Cold War. And then on page 442 to page 445, we talk about the hegemonic assault on the human rights regime that coincides with the war on terror. Okay, so, so then we talk about whether or not this assault is really going to be detrimental to the human rights regime and what the prospects are for the future. And in this article, we also talk about whether or not the human rights regime is weak or not. And many people argue that it's quite weak. But we make an argument that this uh, human rights regime is stronger than most people would argue because it's, it's an, idea, an ideational regime. Um, and so you'll want to read through that element of the article as well. Okay? So then you can make an assessment of, of whether or not you're convinced or not convinced about this particular article, but um, you should be able to discuss what we argue and then um, be able to articulate an opinion about the argument that we present. All right, that's the end of lecture one, and so the next lecture will move forward as we talk more specifically about the different components of the human rights regime.